All right. Well, I think um, we have some returning people. So there'll be a little bit of recap in this workshop if you were here for the last. Um, but for those of you who are joining us and this is your first um, time, maybe it's your first Stormwater Awareness Week class. Welcome uh, to Stormwater Awareness Week 2022. Um, can't believe the first day of Stormwater Awareness Week is almost over. Um, this has been a, a great week. Again, watch the keynote if you, uh, if you have time, if you haven't seen it already. Um, they are very informative. Uh, the first one, I, I think it's my favorite. Um, I'm not in it, but I really enjoyed the content on that, so I'd recommend that one. Um, but uh, as Rebecca said, this is, uh, or should have done this afterwards, um, we're talking about illicit discharge detection and elimination training, IDDE training. So the goal of this, um, this is not an all-encompassing uh, training for um, illicit discharge detection and elimination practices or for uh, to implement a program, but what it does hopefully do is uh, uh, give some refresher on the phase two MS4 permits um, uh, requirements for training for uh, illicit discharge detection elimination training, IDDE. And, um, and that's really what it is. It's to kind of refresh us on what the permit requires, uh, what to look for. And um, uh, yeah, so let's just dive into it. Uh, my name is Jonas Honor. Again, if, you're, if you're just joining us, um, uh, I am a SciSec QSP with WGR Southwest. I run our municipal compliance program here. Uh, I've been working here for going on eight years, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a fun, fun gig. So this is my contact information if you want to reach out to me. Um, it'll be again at the end of the end of the workshop. Um, we have a saying advice is free over coffee. So if you want to just ask me a question or uh, run something past me, feel free to just drop oh, same way. Um, so with that, what are we hoping to get out of this workshop today? Um, we have a couple learning outcomes. First one is going to be, how do we identify an illicit discharge or illegal connection? Um, and then the second is understanding the permits requirements on reporting and response to those spills or illicit discharges. And then we're also going to, to discuss um, corrective action and investigation procedures. And again, this isn't uh, an in-depth on investigation and, and uh, uh, corrective action, um, but it's uh, general guidelines and um, refreshers on uh, some standards. So with that, uh, I started the last workshop by looking at the permit. I'm gonna do this one as well. Um, we're going to take a look here at, uh, this is section E7, B1 of the phase two MS4 permit. Somebody asked in the last class, so I'll just say it again. F uh, MS4 is municipal uh, separate storm sewer system. I, I, I get dyslexic on that. So if I did it that time, but it's four S's, municipal uh, separate storm sewer system. And now I'm not confident if that's correct or all. But MS4, we have a permit, a phase two permit, and this is our education requirements for our field staff on illicit discharge detection. So what does it require of us? Well, it requires, um, one, that we know how to identify an illicit discharge. Uh, and the second is proper procedures for reporting and responding to the illicit discharge or legal connection. Um, Follow-up training shall be provided as needed to address changes in procedures, techniques, or staffing. And again, this is for um, our program managers. This is what we want our training program to, to cover. Um, if we have field staff here, that's great. Hopefully you're getting a, um, a general overview of this. But um, again, for program managers, you'll want to look at your own program and review and train your guys on, or, or gals, on specific procedures and using forms and whatnot that are available for your facility. Um, and then uh, the next thing is an annual assessment of their trained knowledge of listed discharge response and refresher training as needed. So this is for what we call traditional MS4s. For non-traditional, um, your requirements are in section F5, and they all are pretty similar to this. For the education uh, response, there's a couple of differences, and we're going to look at those now between traditional and non-traditional. So if you are a non-traditional, uh, listen up, because these are going to be slightly different for you. So the next requirement is for new staff members, 
we need to provide them this illicit discharge detection training. If it's part of their normal job responsibilities, we need to provide them this training um, within six months after the start of employment. So again, program managers, listen up. Um, we need to train our staff six months after they start uh, started. If they work with um, uh, anything where they might have to handle a spill or responding to a spill or coming across an illicit discharge or spill and need to know how to report on it within six months. Now for non-traditional MS4s, there is no time requirement. There's no time requirement. Um, you do still need to provide training, but there's no six month requirement mandated in the permit. So that's your main difference. And the next one um, is fairly important. Contact information, including the procedure for reporting an illicit discharge needs to be included in each of the fleet vehicles used by um, field staff. So they need to have it readily accessible. If they come across a spill or an illicit discharge, they need to have procedures readily available for them in their, in their vehicles of who to call, who to contact, how to respond to it. So again, program managers, write that down. If you're doing that, it's a good, it's a good thing to go and check after this class to see, hey, do you guys have your procedures? Do you know how to respond to illicit discharge? And maybe put together some quiz questions based on what we talk about here and, um, and talk with your staff about it and, and uh, um, address some of these things. Uh, last one, again, this is only for traditional, non-traditional, this isn't even required for you. Uh, focused education on, illicit, on identified illicit discharges and associated illicit discharge locations. So what this is requiring is um, if you have problem areas, so like you have an older part of town, it's older infrastructure, or you have an older sewer area that's been leaking a lot or breaking down, you have having more sanitary sewer overflows, those are the areas that want to prioritize and focus your education on so that staff are familiar and know where to look for these trouble areas. Um, and a little bit of warning, there are some gross pictures in here. Uh, I've tried to not put too many gross pictures, but there are some. So if you're squeamish, just fair warning about that. Um, so some definitions. Let me just throw some terms and conditions out and some acronyms that I'm going to be talking about. Um, just so that we're all on the same page and you're not scratching your head and like, what is this fool talking about? So some terms and definitions and acronyms for us. Stormwater, if you were here for the last one, uh, it's water originating from precipitation and ice, snow, and hail melt. Um, similarly, non-stormwater is any discharge not entirely comprised of stormwater. And this is what we typically will call an illicit discharge. Um, as far as the MS4 permit is considered, they considered a non-stormwater discharge. Um, that's a broad definition and kind of summary, but when I mention a non-stormwater discharge, it usually does mean an illicit discharge. There is an exception to that. We'll cover that a little bit later. Um, but uh, generally, when I say non-stormwater discharge, it does mean illicit discharge. Uh, put a pin there, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, so uh, conveyance system, you know, I talked in our, in our last workshop, uh, we have stormwater and urban runoff is a source of a lot of pollutants. It's, it can be really, uh, really dirty. And from our municipal operations or facilities or streets, it can transport a lot of pollutants and it transports through the MS4 conveyance system. And we said in that one, it's uh, a system that conveys stormwater, ultimately discharging into waters of the United States, and it has to be owned and operated by a public agency. And this includes streets, catch basins, curbs and gutters, ditches, man-made channels, retention basins, and storm drains. Now, uh, if you recognize my certifications on the, on the title slide, you might recognize I work a lot with construction. Um, it's a misnomer that just because something goes into a basin, means that it's not going to reach receiving water. Um, where I work in Lodi, we have a lot of park basins and water goes into these park basins and it can either park into the ground or it can go out into the receiving water. And it is maintained by the public agency. It's maintained by the city. So that is part of our storm drain system. So even though it's going to a basin, um, it's still part of our system and it can still cause and contribute pollutants. So when I say conveying system, 
think anything like from the street to the drain inlet to a basin, um, a pump station, you know, anything that can convey water to a receiving water. All right, continuing on. Um, oh, yeah, so I have some pictures here, a channel, you know, uh, with, a, with a little pipe in there, and then street uh, with a curb gutter. All right, so discharge. What do I mean when I say discharge? Um, that is the way I'm defining it in this workshop is water that runs off and leaves a certain property um, facility or a, a site or job site and enters the MS4 conveyance system. So it can be running off of your corp yard and going across the fence and into the street. That's a discharge. Um, a direct discharge, there's, there's two types, a direct and a non-direct. Um, a direct discharge is one that's routed directly to a receiving water through a pipe, a channel, a ditch. And the important concept is it doesn't co-mingle. It goes directly to that receiving water. So it doesn't have any other influence. It's just from whatever that area was, it'll directly go to the receiving water. Indirect, um, conversely, uh, co-mingles with water sources prior to being discharged. So there could be a lot of things influencing this discharge uh, into receiving water. Um, and so it's, it's, for lack of a better term, it muddies the water when you're trying to figure out the source of an illicit discharge. Um, and then uh, also with that, you can have either a stormwater discharge or non-stormwater discharge. Um, and we'll call non-stormwater discharges usually illicit discharges. Um, and we'll see again, I'll define that in a little bit. Uh, just hold, hold and bear with me. All right, next one, outfall. What do I mean when I say outfall? This can mean a couple different things to different people. Um, but the textbook definition is a point source where an MS4 system, so specifically the MS4 system, will discharge to the waters of the United States with no other conveyance means. Um, so for us, again, in Lodi, uh, the, the outfall is sometimes, or it's always, or mostly, sorry, in the river. Um, we have some that are underwater, so they're inaccessible, usually when the lake is full. Um, but some are above the water, and they're, they're accessible. And so they go straight into the river. Um, and we have to go and inspect those, as we'll, we'll talk about here a little bit. Sometimes outfall refers to the final point where runoff leaves a specific facility or site. Um, that is not a good way to refer to, to that. We call that a discharge point, usually, um, to avoid uh, mixing up the nomenclature. So outfall, just try to think for this purposes. Um, it's going to be uh, basically a pipe ending up into a river. All right, and I'm also going to be talking a lot about BMPs. If you were here for the previous workshop, this will be familiar to you. It's a best management practice. It's a practice or combination of practices that are effective and practical to prevent or reduce pollutants. And the other thing is that they are proven to reduce pollutants over um, uh, repeated use. You can, you can repeat and get the same or similar results. And there's two types. You have structural or procedural, or I call them physical and, and procedural. Again, nothing earth shattering. Um, this is just some definitions to kind of make sure we're all knowing what we're talking about as we go into this class. All right. So how do we identify an illicit discharge? What are some common um, sources and signs? Uh, so as we say before, illicit discharges are any discharge to an MS4 that is not complete entirely comprised of clean stormwater. Um, and that exception that I've kept hinting at and alluding to is um, the list of allowable discharges. Um, they call it allowable non-stormwater discharges. And so that's why typically we'll refer to it as a, a stormwater discharge, um, a non-stormwater discharge referring to the allowable non-stormwater discharges, and then illicit discharges. Try to separate some of the, the muddy meaning there. At least that's what I like. So um, this is a, a sample from an admissible ordinance. Um, and really, most municipalities in California, if you're under a phase two or a phase one, should have something similar to this. They should have a list of what um, the municipality is, is considering an allowable discharge. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but um, one to note because uh, 
Uh, a lot of where I'm getting some of this information I'm sharing uh, is from the Center for Watershed Protection's Illicit Discharge Manual, and they consider uh, landscape ir irrigation uh, runoff an illicit discharge. Uh, some municipal ordinances do not consider that an illicit discharge unless it's carrying pollutants like sediment or grass clippings or fertilizer. So, um, uh, so again, some of these are the, the general rule of thumb for this is they have to be clean, uh, like pool discharges. It has to be dechlorinated, um, natural flows from repairing habitats or wetlands, air conditioning condensate, that's potable water, um, that's not really carrying any pollutants. And so the, the other thing is any, any allowable non-stormwater discharge can become an illicit discharge if it's carrying or transported pollutants. And so that's how we, um, we really define uh, an illicit discharge is it, it's usually dry weather, measurable flow um, that's containing pollutants. Um, and why dry weather? Because if it's during wet weather, uh, we'll usually just call that a contaminated stormwater discharge. Um, but during dry weather, if we have measurable flow in our conveyance system, that's probably an illicit discharge because it's not raining and there's water in our storm drain system. So it's either an allowable discharge or it's carrying pollutants with it. And, um, uh, and, and now it's an illicit discharge. So the most common illicit discharge is going to be a sanitary sewer overflow. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a break in the sewer main or buildup of fats, oil, and grease will back up a pipe and it'll overflow out of a manhole and into the storm drain. Um, and so that's the typical and most common sanitary sewer overflow as an illicit discharge. Um, and uh, illegal sewer connections are also um, uh, a high rate of illicit discharges. Um, spills or you know, accidents, wrecked cars can leak fluids that'll enter the storm drain system that can cause an illicit discharge as well. Um, but the main idea is they have to be carrying pollutants. Industrial commercial sites are also um, frequent uh, contributors. Um, You'll also see in older infrastructure, maybe more illegal connections from, um, uh, from older industrial uh, complexes. There's an industrial client we've worked for, for several years and it took us several years to find out they actually had um, a, uh, a processed water drain piped into the facility next, or uh, let's say the next door facility had a processed water drain that was piped into our industrial facility stormwater system. So we kept having all of this process water and we were like, where is this coming from? It smells like, um, you know, we could, we could smell, it wasn't stormwater, it, it smelled like a, a, a wine. And we were like, where is this coming from? And we realized there is a, a legal connection from their process water drain into our storm sewer system or into our stormwater system. So again, older infrastructure, what happened was, Years ago, it was one facility, and then they sold a portion of it, and it was two facilities with two different owners, but that old infrastructure was still there under the ground, and it took us that many years um, to find out that it was connected that way. So um, we call these in the permit and in the illicit discharge programs generating sites, and so it's good to be familiar with your generating sites as you develop or um, are looking at your IDDE program. Um, because you'll probably have less documentation of those legal connections um, because they may be old plans or things just got lost or maybe somebody just tied something in um, years ago. So uh, having knowledge of your generating sites, the problem areas, older infrastructure, that's how you're gonna be able to find these flows and, and detect these illicit discharges more readily. Uh, so discharge frequencies, uh, there's going to be three types. Um, and again, this comes from the uh, CWP's uh, manual for developing an IDD program. Uh, they call three frequencies out as continuous, intermittent, and transitory. Uh, continuous is pretty, um, they're all self-explanatory, fairly self-explanatory. Continuous, it's always going. It's flowing, there's measurable flow 
all through the summer. You know, something's really going on here and it's going through our storm drain system. What is it? So it's usually um, easier to detect because uh, if there's always going to be flow, you're probably going to find the source of it if you travel upstream and, and find where that flow is coming from. Um, because they are continuous, they will also um, potentially carry the greatest pollutant load if they are carrying pollutants. Now, if it doesn't carry pollutant, it's just a discharge. It's a, and we'll, we'll walk through those steps of how to determine that in a little bit here. But um, if we do investigate and find out it's, it's just clean water, it's okay, then it's, it's okay. We don't need to document it. But if it's carrying pollutants, then we really need to address it and, and reduce, um, reduce uh, the impact from that. So uh, again, continuous, they're always flowing. They're easy to detect and trace and, and usually easy to stop, but they can carry the greatest balloon load. So you don't want to um, slack on that. Intermittent, they're more infrequent. They can occur over a few hours or maybe a few days per year. This might be your landscape runoff. Think of um, you know, a bunch of neighbors fertilizing their lawns at the same time. And so they're watering a lot more um, to get a nice green color on their lawn. Well, now that's carrying a lot more water, probably a lot more runoff. They're using a lot more, they're having more runoff. And if everybody in the neighborhood is doing it, <clears throat> then it's all flowing to the same storm drains and, and you'll probably have a much higher flow. We actually do have an outfall that's like that. And, and every year I go out, it's always flowing a little bit because they water their lawns a little bit more regularly. And, uh, um, and we usually see some flow coming from that. Um, it's always come back good numbers, so it hasn't been a problem. But um, yeah, so it's usually a few hours or a few days per year um, and uh, hard to detect, um, but they can still represent a serious water quality problem um, if, uh, if, they, um, if they aren't, if they are cont um, containing enough pollutants in them. So transitory, I'm ah, sorry, transitory discharges occur rarely, um, but they can be the most catastrophic. And again, this would be the category of a sewer break, a ruptured tank, um, or a large spill or a large wreck, a lot of stuff going into the drain at once. Um, these dis discharges are much harder to detect with routine monitoring, um, but depending on the source event, um, it might be easy to identify. Um, you know, somebody's calling and saying, their toilet's backing up or saying there's sewer overflow in the street. Usually those we can, we can address right away. Um, but if it's an illegal connection or um, a spill that happened, it might not be easy to detect. We might catch it after it's already discharged to the receiving water. Um, so these are the most time sensitive ones and they're most critical, um, but uh, they, they don't happen as often. Um, and these discharges have different modes of entry. There are two modes of entry, a direct and indirect. Um, the direct is that, again, direct connection to a pipe or channel. Um, and the phase two permit defines this as an illegal connection. Uh, that's, so when I'm saying illicit connection or illegal connection, that's, that's what I mean. Somebody has put a pipe in there that is not allowed and they are illegally piping that in. But it all, it all no, I'm sorry, it can also be um, a flow or going right into a channel or into a roadside ditch um, and uh, different, different ways that I can directly get in there. Ele uh, indirect entry is for spills or illegal dumping and it takes several steps to get in before it reaches the receiving water and commingles with a few different things. Um, so again, just more terminology to, to understand there. Common flow types. Um, I mentioned a few already. These are the four common types uh, that you'll see uh, illicit discharges, four categories, so to speak. Um, sewage and septic flows. Again, we've, we've talked about that quite a bit already. Um, uh, high rate of illicit discharges come from that. Um, these two pictures are fairly recent. Um, this is a, a sanitary sewer overflow from, uh, from a residential neighborhood, um, fog related, fat soils and grease. Uh, backed up and uh, didn't clean out their grease tanks from a, from a nearby um, uh, hotel. And so it overflowed in this res residential neighborhood right into the storm drain, right, right next to it. You can see it's not a very high rate of flow, but it's still discharging. Um, 
So again, pretty self-explanatory, but it also does um, include uh, portable toilets. Um, so for you that work on construction or maybe your roads crew that have a portable toilet in the street it would be a septic illicit discharge if that toilet spilled in the street. Wash water um, and liquid waste, they, they can kind of blend in terminology, but when I'm saying wash water, I'm, I'm generally talking about it is clean water that was used for washing activity. Um, and uh, it can be from a wide variety of uh, activities and operations. Um, gray water from laundromats uh, or from homes even, commercial car washing wastewater, uh, fleet washing, um, and then uh, construction and municipal operations, water to use to wash out paint, concrete, or other construction related materials. Um, I would categorize as wash water flows. Uh, this picture is from, uh, don't worry, this is process water, uh, but usually they'll have detergents or and they'll carry other pollutants with, uh, with them in this runoff. Um, and so sudsy water is usually wash water. You'll, you'll see that there. Liquid wastes um, <clears throat> uh, usually mean uh, actually a liquid running off um, uh, from an area. So it could be oil, it could be paint, um, it could be processed water. Uh, it's, it's usually... Uh, um, an actual liquid material, not necessarily water that's carrying pollutants, um, but it's, it, it can be that. So again, terms are kind of crossing in there, um, but this is water from other materials, um, or I'm sorry, liquid from other, other sources. Um, another example of this, um, I, this is, a, this is a, a pump, this is a, a stormwater pump, and um, it's overdue for some maintenance. You can see some oily rags and maybe some buckets. And you think, oh, that's, that's not so bad. The problem is um, this pump is actually on top of the, uh, the, the stormwater basin. So water is underneath this pump station and it can drain, that oil there can drain off into the receiving water. Um, so this is an illicit discharge. Um, we found this as we were doing um, O&M inspections for a facility that it just hadn't been addressed and it had a way to get out into the receiving water. So this was a, definitely an illicit discharge and needed to be addressed right away. Um, they needed to um, provide better containment, um, they needed to maintain this pump, uh, something needed to happen so that it wasn't, it wasn't putting oil into the, into the stormwater. Um, so that's what I'm kind of referring to as liquid waste. Um, you also have tap water flows. Um, they can be from leaks or losses occurring as you're distributing drinking water into the water system supply. I showed this picture in my last workshop. Um, this is working on um, the water line for homes. Um, so it's bringing in drinking water and they were maintaining it. So it is clean water, um, but now it's carrying sediment into the street. And so they needed to put in some BMPs, they needed to berm the work area they were doing, they protected the storm drains so that it wasn't taking sediment with it. Um, but it can also uh, just be more carrying the other pollutants. But um, yeah, so next, how do we find these flows? Um, I mentioned that it's measurable flow during um, dry weather. So how are we gonna find them? Well, there's a couple of different ways that we might be able to um, identify these flows. It's routine inspections and maintenance of the system. So as we're going and actually cleaning out catch basins, we're checking, is there flow? Um, or we're looking through our uh, storm system, we're popping manhole lids. Are we seeing, oh, there's a, there's a flow in here. It's dry. It's the middle of summer. We need to trace where this is coming from. Um, you might stumble across it by accident. I've... I've had um, uh, city managers call me on the way to work saying, hey, I found an illicit discharge. Uh, we need to go respond on it. Um, I've come across them on my way to work. I've come across them driving through another city that I don't work in. I've called that city and said, hey, I found an illicit discharge. Found them on vacation. <laughs> they, can, they can be stumbled upon by accident. That's uh, a common way I find it. 
um, or another common way, calls or complaints from citizen reporting. That's another very common one. Um, and then we'll also find uh, permit required. Uh, we have to find them during outfall investigations. So at the end of the pipe, if we see water coming out at the end of the pipe into the receiving water, um, as we're doing our annual uh, priority outfall investigations, um, we'll need to sample that. We'll need to uh, profile it if it's, um, if it's flowing. And again, that's uh, during dry weather um, that we're going to be doing that. But for our traditional MS4s, we'll do annual priority investigations and we'll, we'll have to find if there's any flow in there and then uh, document that and follow up on that. I'll explain a little bit more on that in a, in a second here. Um, for you non-traditional MS4s, again, the um, military bases or maybe universities that are joining us here, non-traditional MS4s only need to do this during the initial outfall investigation. So if you hear annual priority investigation, you're like, did I miss something? Did I misread it? It's only during that initial outfall investigation that you have to do that outfall monitoring. Um, you still have to do all the other, if you find something, you have to profile it, investigate it, uh, as we'll look at here. But um, for outfall, as, as far as outfall required, it's only during um, your initial investigation. For traditional, sorry, it's every year at your priority. All right, so here's a flow chart. I put it here to help kind of um, break this down for us of where we're going. So the first step is, is the source of the discharge known? Can we look up on the street and see, hey, that guy's watering his lawn. I can see it entering the storm drain and there's a reasonable amount of flow. I think it's from that landscape irrigation runoff. Excuse me. It's not carrying pollutants. It's probably allowable based on our, excuse me, municipal ordinances. So we'll walk through our flow, flow chart. Do we know the source? Yes. Is the discharge allowable? If it says yes, then we document it and no further action is required. If it's uh, not known or if it's not allowable, we need to do some extra steps. Um, let's just say uh, we know the discharge is allowable. I'm sorry, uh, the discharge is not allowable. We know that. Uh, what we have to do is immediately, if we know it's not an allowable discharge, if it's truly an illicit discharge, we can see pollutants with it. Um, then we immediately begin investigation and corrective action processes there. Um, if it's really hard to tell, uh, then we do what we call indicator monitoring. And the one part of this chart that kind of breaks down is that we do physical indicator monitoring first. Um, that's right as we're looking at the discharge. We'll look at that next. Um, but what this means is indicator monitoring is that's kind of a, a profiling. We're, we're monitoring a sweep of the constituents most of them are going to be out in the field um, to see and test the water to see if there's any um, source of pollutants in there. And so if it's below um, uh, what they call action level concentrates, as we'll see described in the permit, um, then we begin the investigation and corrective action process as needed. Uh, I'm sorry, then we'll document and no further action is required. If it's above those action level concentrates, um, then we'll begin that investigation, corrective action procedures. So basic breakdown and flow there. Um, and uh, let's, let's talk about physical indicators next, because this is going to be our first step here. So we have um, seven indicators that we're going to look at for um, determining right off the bat, uh, is this allowable, is this not allowable? Um, it's really, they're, they're, they're pretty foolproof. Um, first one is color. Is your water green? Um, this picture here is on a construction site, but I just threw it in there because this was a, this was a spill of, of some material. This was, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but the water literally was green. And uh, this, was, this was not a good situation here on this inspection. Um, so that's your first point is, is the color. Is, does it look like there's something in the water besides clean water? Um, sometimes it's not a problem, like uh, organic debris can cause uh, different colorations that don't affect water quality. Um, but most often, if you see a weird color in your water, um, it's not an allowable discharge. Um, the second would be odors. 
does it smell like sewage or does it smell like wine in the case that I was talking about earlier? Um, as you're looking into the manhole, you'll probably notice an odor coming off of it. If it smells rancid, if it smells like sewage, or if it smells uh, funky in any way, that's a good indicator that there's something other than clean stormwater in there and we need to go to um, profiling or characterizing what that discharge is. Another option uh, or another uh, indicator, turbidity. Is the mutter, is the, bleh, is the water muddy? Is it dirty? Is it cloudy? Don't worry, this is mud. <laughs> this isn't sewage. Um, this is mud in a storm drain. And uh, this is an illicit discharge. This is not allowable. Um, this is going out into, um, into uh, a roadside ditch that'll end up into a receiving water. Not allowable. So this was definitely a corrective action situation. But turbidity, you can, you can see in there, hey, look at that. Muddy water, illicit discharge. Um, if you can't see through it, if it looks like chocolate milk, probably over the action level concentrate. Um, another good one is sheens. Um, and this isn't the colorants from, or uh, tannins and lignans from organic debris. This is actually oil sheens, oil and grease. They're very visible. Um, they're shiny. You might have the, the iridescent uh, colors like this, or it could just be a, a slight like bubbly sheen you'll see on the water. Um, good sign that you might have a spill of oil or gas or diesel. Um, you'll probably also smell that too when you run off. Floatables um, does not mean trash, does not mean just stuff bobbing up and down in the water. Um, what this is usually referring to is suds or um, like toilet paper or other products you might see in a sanitary sewer overflow. Um, this is how we determine uh, wash water and um, sanitary sewer overflow uh, water um, usually is defined by floatables. Pretty self-explanatory. Growth, this might be a little bit harder to determine, but this might be around at the outfall or at the drain inlet. I've actually seen it at certain drain inlets near parks where there's a lot of vegetation around in the cracks of the drain inlet. Um, how did that get there? probably by fertilizer runoff. Fertilizer runoff sprouted up weeds in the, in the street and it has regular enough water that it gets watered and fertilized and it, it grows. Um, also, if you're at an outfall and the grass around the outfall is dry and uh, in the drainage area is, is green, you might have frequent flows coming to that outfall that could be potentially illicit. Um, so doing it in the summer when it's hot or towards the end of summer before we get rain is a good idea to, um, for your IDD program. Um, just to check to say, hey, is there flows coming through here? Because this should not be green. This should be brown if there's no water coming through this pipe during summer. So this is an indicator that something is coming through here. And then also staining and damage. <coughs> Excuse me. This typically refers to in the pipe or in the catch basin, you can see stains going into the catch basin or um, in the drainage system. Here, I liked this picture because you had two different types of stains. You had a concrete waste stain going into the drain this way. And then from the other side, you had a sediment runoff uh, going into the drain. Um, thankfully, this was just going into this little retention area um, behind it. Uh, so it, it wasn't actually leaving the property, um, but still, a non-compliant situation because this could get into the ground or it could stay in the pipe and continually leach pollutants. Um, but stain is a good way to um, identify spills or just things we don't want going down into the drain. So physical indicators, first step. Um, that tells us there is a problem, but to fully identify or to characterize, as I like to say, we need to look at indicator monitoring. Um, and so this is a list of constituents that we're going to sample against. Um, and I'll just read some of them off to you. We, have, we can measure for color, conductivity, um, detergents or surfactants, um, fluoride. If you fluorinate your water, that's a good way to identify if you have drinking water in your runoff. Um, hardness and potassium, um, pH and turbidity, and ammonia. Um, this is a, a, a pretty good sweep of monitoring. All of these can be done in the field. Um, hardness of potassium is pretty, 
is pretty stressful to do in the field if you've if you've ever done it. Typically, I like to send this to the lab. It's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and uh, same thing with uh, detergents or factants. I believe there is a field test. It's not as reliable, so that's better to send to the lab. It's a quick turnaround. It's a cheap test. Um, so I usually do um, the majority of these in the field, and then detergents, um, hardens some potassium. I send off to the laboratory um, when I'm doing my testing. But this is we we use this to confirm this is an illicit discharge and to help provide clues about its source or origin. And we use this just to determine how excuse me how bad is this? What is the source of it? Um, can we characterize where this is coming from and pinpoint so we can um, stop this? Was it a spill? Was it maybe a transitory um, or maybe more intermittent uh, process water connection or legal connection? Um, we need to do indicator monitoring. We are required as a municipality to perform indicator monitoring at any outfalls where flow or ponding of water is observed more than 72 hours after the last rain event. So again, this is during our annual um, priority outfall investigations. Um, if we see flow at an outfall and it hasn't rained for more than 72 hours, um, you know, it's, it's dry weather, and we see flow or ponding of water, we need to sample that and, and, uh, um, and perform indicator monitoring. Now, we can't really perform indicator monitoring on ponded water. Um, and I'm not really too sure if they actually do want us to here, but uh, it's, it's not a good, it doesn't really tell us good information. So if you can get it in the flow, get it in the flow. Um, and uh, indicator monitoring should be utilized if the source of the non-stormwater flow is unknown. Again, if you know where it's coming from, you can see where it's coming from. You can see pollutants with it. You don't really need to go through this step, um, but uh, it is required if you are at an outfall and you see flow on a dry day. Here's uh, the list again to blow it up a little bit. And this comes from uh, the permit. I believe they get this information from the Center for Watership Protections manual. Um, and these indicators, if we have high numbers in these certain indicators, it'll just help us characterize, is it sewage, wash water, tap water, or commercial liquid waste? So you can find that. That's table three, um, I believe, of the MS4 phase two permit in section E9. Um, continuing on with indicator monitoring, I mentioned action level concentrates, or a ALCs, uh, previously. And so for those constituents, um, we have some limits of what we can discharge under. Um, and if you've worked in reporting or analytical stuff before, um, the thing you'll note is that these are pretty high um, numbers. First off, the turbidity is 1,000 NTU, which that maxes out most field units, 1,000 NTUs. Um, pH, 5 to 9. Um, nine is not really a good, uh, a good pH number to have in your runoff. If you are under the construction general permit, um, 8.5 is your limit or uh, 6.5 is your low limit. So between five and nine is pretty lenient. Um, ammonia, 50 milligrams per liter, um, very high number. Um, I would not want to be near a discharge that had 50 milligrams per liter of ammonia in it. Um, that could potentially be lethal. Um, connectivity, very high number. And so to actually break one of these action level concentrates is very, um, very difficult. It had to be a very catastrophic or um, um, very toxic dump uh, to be breaking these action level concentrates easily. Um, Turbidity is probably the only one, or pH would be the only one that's easy to break. I've had pH of two on an outfall that I've monitored before. Um, and I'm not sure if it was technically an equipment error or something like that, but uh, I did get a couple readings of, of two and three at that outfall. <clears throat> so some tests should only be performed in the field. Uh, pH is, is limited to 15 minutes. You have to do that within 15 minutes of taking your sample. So again, you can do this a combination of lab and field. I'd recommend to do 70% field, 30% lab, um, pH you have to do into the field, turbidity I'd recommend doing in the field, 
Um, it just gives you better numbers. Um, and uh, if we do send it to a lab, it needs to be ELAP certified. It needs to be holding that certificate, uh, certificate for um, parameter analysis. Um, and you can't take a hybrid approach. It's, it's allowed in the permit. Now, I was reading just today, <clears throat> as I refreshed my own knowledge, um, the permit does allow you to, if you have um, uh, local knowledge, um, and I saw some uh, comments already about chlorination. So that's a good example. If you know chlorine is high in your, um, in your water, you can add that. In, in like in place of fluoride, you can add chlorine to what you're sampling. Um, and uh, um, there's uh, other, if you have knowledge of other common pollutants or other things that you know might show up based on your generating sites or just um, your constituents in, in your neighborhood, um, you can sample for those. This is not an end all be all. Uh, list. We can modify this, but if we do modify it, we do need to just report on that in our annual permit or, at, or in our annual report on SMARTS. So in case you were unaware, that is allowed to do. All right, what happened there? All right, so I've been talking about reporting requirements. Um, and so what are our reporting requirements? When do I need to, to, uh, to address this stuff? Well, um, MS4s are required to conduct investigations of all sources of any suspected illicit discharges. So again, we're out on inspection or just driving past, we see water flowing in a drain. Um, we have 72 hours of becoming aware of the suspected discharge um, before we need to um, implement an investigation and then corrective action. Now, how do we know is, how do we define aware? Because that's kind of ambiguous. Is it when we find the discharge, or is it when we know we've characterized the discharge? Um, we have reached out to the water board when the permit was newer um, several years ago. And the way this was intended to be written was um, when the municipality receives the analysis back from the lab, that's, that's acceptable. So if you have to perform indicator monitoring and you send some of those samples off to the lab and you have a 10 day turnaround, <coughs> that is um, allowable because you're not aware of what the discharge is. It could be nothing. It could just be um, clean water. Um, everything comes back very low below those action level concentrates. And then we don't have to implement corrective action on that. And we just document that. So that 72 hours triggers when we know what that water is. So when you see, become aware, 72 hours, think of when I know for a fact what this water is. Now, if you know it's a sanitary sewer overflow, definitely implement corrective action, um, as we'll see here um, in, uh, in a second. Um, Non-stormwater discharges or illicit discharges, uh, suspected of being sanitary sewer or significantly contaminated, need to be prioritized and investigated within 24 hours. So if we're confident you know, this is sewage or this is significantly contaminated, we heighten that up. We don't wait for the, the lab to get back to us in 10 days. We just begin our investigation process and corrective action within 24 hours. Um, and then immediately, immediately report any occurrence of flows believed to be an immediate threat to human health or the environment. Um, we report that to the local health department. So that could be getting the county involved. That could be um, calling and involving the fire department for cleanup. Um, and again, that would be sanitary sewer overflow that can reach the, the river very quickly. Um, that'll immediately need to be reported. Um, now, there might be other steps we take in that, but um, if something could be a threat to human health or the environment and it's serious, we, well, that is serious, um, we call and report that immediately. We don't wait on that. All right, so we've been talking about investigations and, and, uh, and follow-ups, so let's, let's talk about that now a little bit more in depth. Um, hopefully this will be, I'm just gonna kind of scratch the surface of this. This goes more in depth in the Center for Watershed Protections Manual. I'd recommend going back and reading that um, if you're unfamiliar with this. But to perform investigations, we use a couple different methods. The first being the, the trunk investigation or the storm drain network investigation. 
Um, this is just, we, we see flow in this drain inlet. We're gonna move up the storm drain network or the trunk, and we're gonna find where it, where it ends so that we can pinpoint the neighborhood or community that it's, that it's flowing in. Usually it can happen very quickly in the field. Um, and we, uh, if we have a couple crews involved, we can split off and, and, and check different branches of the trunk um, to, to limit where that flow is coming from to help us characterize the source. Um, this is probably the easiest, fastest way if you have um, an illicit discharge that you found and you wanna to try to quickly determine the source, this is the quickest way to do it. Um, I, I've done this a few times in the past, usually within an hour, you can find the source of a discharge. Um, even if you were at an outfall, you can get back on land, um, go up the network and find where that discharge was coming from pretty quickly. Um, something that might be a little bit harder to determine, we'd have to do a drainage area investigation. So that's looking at um, plans or land use areas or um, industrial commercial inventory review. If we are struggling to find that intermittent discharge, um, but we have some physical indicators, we really need to like look through business license. We need to look through permits. We need to look at what might be um, discharging into this storm drain network and reaching where we're seeing flow. Um, we might not be able to pinpoint the source. So this might be where we look at businesses and just try to determine from that side. Um, also, um, just um, uh, generator knowledge or generator site information, um, older older plans if we if we have those um, or even aerials on Google Earth can help us pinpoint these sources. Um, and if we need to verify an illegal connection, um, an on-site investigation would be the way to do it. Um, that's how we found out we actually had that tie-in from the process water system is is putting water down that drain and seeing it come out on our side. Um, and uh, you can also use cameras or, um, or, or dyes, uh, but uh, this is how we, we generally uh, determine illegal connections or um, finding sources of, of different things. Improving our theories is, is cameras or dyes and seeing it come out through the, uh, through the storm drain network. Um, pretty self-explanatory. This is elaborated a lot more on in the manual. I'd recommend going and reading that. Um, so what does the permit require of us to do after we've had corrective action? I'm sorry, um, after we've determined the source. So now we are, um, uh, we know what it is. Um, and if we haven't done this already, we're going to attempt to stop the source of the discharge as soon as possible. That really should be, if we can do that, we should do that. Um, if we, if we see something and we can, it's within our power to stop that discharge, we should try and do it even in the middle of characterizing what it is. Um, um, that should be our, that should be our first step. And then determine the size and scope of pollute, potential pollutant impact. Um, and so for sanitary sewer overflows, this will be, um, you know, we need to monitor, we need to estimate how much flow has been coming off. Uh, how many gallons have gone into the storm drain system? How much have we recovered? Has any reached the receiving water? That sort of thing. Attempt to locate the responsible party if applicable. Uh, sometimes this isn't applicable uh, or sometimes this is impossible. Uh, this picture I have here, this was something that was dumped off of a truck or spilled off of a truck. There was no way the responsible party was being found. Uh, somebody that was driving by just said, hey, this is, I saw a spill. It reached a storm drain and um, the crews have to go out and clean it up. Um, and then develop specific mitigation measures and timelines for the responsible party. If, if you know them, what, what are our corrective actions for them going to be? We're gonna hold them responsible. They're gonna do the cleanup. Um, and then, yeah, they'll, they'll need to respond to that. We have to verify they actually complied with those requirements. And um, uh, with that cleanup and mitigation, make sure they did it right. Um, and then further enforcement, if that's necessary, if they didn't do it wrong, if they, they worsened that, I had an example of that this year, they made matters worse, um, and then document the incidents and, and actions. And of course, if the city needs to step in, follow your enforcement response plan and um, seek remediation for those costs. Uh, that's actually um, allowed in the permit if, 
the responsible party isn't going to take ownership and clean it up and the city has to go and clean it up, then we can hold them responsible for those costs. All right. Required documentation. What do we need to document? Uh, accurate flow measurements, duration of the spill discharge, um, a map of the problem location, inlets and outlets evolved, um, where the discharge occurred. And so that's storm drains, fields, streams, jurisdictional maps. Um, take photos of the event. If you, if you have your phone on you, take photos. Um, I can't recommend that enough. <laughs> Even if you're just driving by, take photos of it, just so you have you know, backup of it. Um, actions taken during the response, including people, equipment, activities, um, mitigation and cleanup measures taken, um, and then the record of correction at corrective actions, any enforcement, any referrals to a higher, uh, higher enforcement agency like the EPA um, or the Water Board, and then a record of follow follow up field verification um, of compliance and mitigation. So I've said this before. Further reading. Um, can't recommend the Center for Watershed Protection's Illicit Discharge and Elimination Manual. Um, it's available free online. Just, just search this. Um, if you want a copy email to you, I'll email it to you. I think I can do this. Um, and then also CASCA has uh, BNP handbooks for spill response, illicit discharge investigations, um, non-storm or discharge. Uh, there are the references there and you can find those free online as well. So with that, um, I had some questions. Rebecca, did you have any questions sent to you? I did not. All of them are in the chat. Okay. All of them are in the chat. All right. So <clears throat> I'll start here. We had um, from, from Garrick, potable water usually contains chlorine. So I would disagree that if a continuous flow of clean water is okay to ignore, typically an MPDS permit is needed to discharge large quantities of potable water. That's a good insight. Um, thank you for that. And yes, I would, I would generally say um, uh, that continuous flows, um, if, if they can be avoided, then, then they should be avoided um, because any, any flow can turn into um, an illicit discharge. And so if another illicit discharge happens and enters that flow, uh, then it's, it's turned into a problem. So I think you have a point there. Um, but what I was trying to say, as far as our permit is required, as far as the phase two MS4 permit is required, um, what we're required to do is if it's, if it's clean, if there's no contaminants or pollutants in there, that as far as we can tell, we just document that and, um, and, and end our investigation. Um, but if you as a municipality decide to take further action, um, that's, that's totally within your jurisdiction and uh, ability to do that. Um, had another comment here on chlorinated pool water as an, ex or I'm sorry, dechlorinated pool water as an acceptable discharge. Um, and they were saying in the city of Modesto, they do not allow any sort of pool drainage as they can uh, potentially impact a rock well, which can lead to flooding of a street. That's another good thing as your local municipality, um, one municipality might allow dechlorination of pool water as an allowable discharge, others may not. That's why it's important to go review your ordinances um, after this talk and make sure that um, I'm not just giving you false information um, because it does change from place to place. Um, definitely more sensitive areas, the requirements get more stringent. So those on the coast, um, those draining to areas of special biological significance probably have different requirements of what can actually go down the drain. Um, so definitely check your own ordinances and your own programs. This is general information. Um, that I'm trying to provide for you. So um, hope that was clear. All right, let's see. Um, can we get a copy of the presentation? Uh, yes, sir, I can email it to you. Um, if we have your email, um, I can send that to you. Uh, and then would you be able to cover more examples of thresholds, definitions of what is considered serious or hazard discharges? Um, thank you for that qu question, Mary. Um, I would usually, this is, this is how I do it. So this isn't textbook or, or technical. Um, but what I, as I'm in the field determining these things for myself, I ask the question, would I drink this? Would I get into this water? Would I swim in this water? Um, if this ended up into the river, would I want my children to swim in this water? And if the answer is no, um, probably, 
uh, probably consider that a more serious discharge and would want to follow up on that. Now, again, that, that could be very broad. Um, and uh, um, a serious discharge could be uh, a car wreck and gasoline went down on the storm drain. I consider that serious. Um, or a lot of sediment went down on the storm drain from a construction site or um, from something, something else catastrophic. Um, that, that would be more serious to me. Hazardous, definitely sanitary sewer overflow, um, anything that could contribute to a health hazard, um, that would be a serious or hazardous discharge. And if it's labeled as a hazardous material, it's definitely a hazardous discharge. Um, email the presentation or love a copy of the video. This is gonna be available online on YouTube free of charge. Um, if you wanna go back, if you wanna share this with your staff, or your field staff, feel free to share it. And again, my uh, contact information is there on the screen. Phone number, you can call me. That's my cell number. If you have any questions, give me a call, email me um, if I don't answer um, and uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you all for participating in Stormwater Awareness Week and in this class. I hope this was informative and helpful for you. Um, and uh, we just really appreciate you uh, um, joining in in this free event. Will there be PDU certifications issued out to the participants after each course? Um, Rebecca, do if you, you email something? us, you can email us at coordinator at stormwaterawareness.org and let us know which class you attended and your name and email. If you just email us, we will get that out to you next week. This week, it's a little crazy because of everything going on, but if you let us know that you would like a certificate, we can get that too. So email us at coordinator at 